Well, once again, thank, uh, thank you. I'd like to thank the organizers for uh, you know, inviting me to give these talks. And um, so I'd like to finish up um, the series of five talks with probably more questions than answers today, although maybe that's true of all the talks I've given so far, uh, except maybe the first one. But um, <clears throat> so, uh, so mainly we've been studying, you know, when can you embed a contact manifold in another contact manifold, and then uh, some constructions you can do. But once you start studying embeddings, of course, the first thing that comes to mind is, what about the isotopy classes of embedding? So, so that's what we're going to spend today talking about. Um, <clears throat> and um, let me just get started with that. So, um, uh, so here I would say are probably the two most basic um, uh, questions. Um, one question is about just the existence of um, embeddings in a particular isotopy class. So if you're given some, some, some isotopy class of embeddings of smooth manifolds, can you make it, um, uh, can you make it uh, a contact embedding? Um, <clears throat> so that's maybe the most basic question, but once you actually maybe have a, a wealth of contact embeddings, you can ask, given two contact embeddings that are smoothly isotopic, you already know that, um, do they have to be contact isotopic? Um, so I guess when I'm talking about contact embeddings, I'm automatically putting the word contact in front of my isotopy. So it's an isotopy through contact embeddings, of course. <clears throat> um, okay, good. So let's start setting these questions. So I'll start with question one. And actually, to tell the truth, we do have some good answers there. In fact, these answers have been around for decades, um, at least in some situations. Um, uh, but before I can state the result, I have to remind you of this kind of little technical thing that goes into the statement of the um, isotopy result. So um, uh, anytime you're given um, a contact structure, you have what's called a conformal symplectic structure that's naturally associated with it. So basically, remember, any contact structure it's given, remember all our contact structures are co-oriented, so they're always given as the kernel of a one form. And that one form, d of that one form, um, if you're going to satisfy the contact condition, d of that one form is going to be non-degenerate when restricted to the contact hyperplanes. So it's a symplectic form on the contact hyperplanes, but it depends on the choice of contact one form, right? But if you choose some other contact one form, since their kernels are exactly the same, linear maps with the same kernels, they differ by a constant multiple. So the one forms differ by um, some functional multiple, some non-zero functional multiple. And then if you look at the d alpha prime, that second one form restricted to the contact hyperplanes, if you look at d alpha prime, you know you're gonna get df wedge alpha plus f d alpha. But when you restrict it to the contact hyperplane, since alpha is zero on the contact hyperplanes, you just get f d alpha. So your symplectic structures differ by a non-zero functional multiple. Well, that's called the conformal symplectic structures, when you have a symplectic structure, but only up to multiplicative factors. So to a contact structure, you have this natural uh, conformal symplectic structure. So this is the technical detail we need to state, um, to state our uh, uh, um, isotopy result, well, not our, Gromov's. As always, it goes back to Gromov for everything, it seems. Um, so um, Gromov, again, I'm quoting his uh, uh, 86 partial differential relation book, but I'm fairly sure it was known uh, quite a bit earlier than that, or at least somewhat earlier than that. So basically, he proves if you have two contact manifolds and you have a topological embedding or a smooth embedding, and here's the technical assumption. You have to say at the tangent level, it looks like it could be a contact embedding because there, you can, there's actually obstructions on kind of the algebraic level or the bundle theory level that prevent a given smooth embedding from being uh, a contact embedding. But he says basically if on the bundle level, you can take the, the, the derivative of the embedding, so that's a map on the tangent bundle, and you can isotop it as bundle maps to something that actually uh, takes the contact uh, planes into the contact planes, hyperplanes, um, and preserves the conformal symplectic structure. Then if the co-dimension is bigger than or equal to four, you can always actually isotop it in a C0 small way to be a contact embedding. So the isotopy problem is super easy in co-dimension four. While super easy, you have to be able to work out some bundle theory here, which can be actually quite a pain when you do it in a particular example. But again, it's reducing it to an algebraic topological problem that has a well-defined way of trying to solve. And in most cases, you, well, maybe I shouldn't say that. In many cases, um, you can work that out. <clears throat> So it's basically saying if you really want to study the contact, uh, th this problem of realizing um, isotopy classes of embeddings um, by contact embeddings, uh, the interesting case, the only really interesting case, is uh, co-dimension two. Well, I guess co-dimension zero could be quite interesting too, but we're not going to say anything about that here. Um, okay. So, um, <clears throat> so right. So we're going to restrict our attention to co-dimension two, and as I've been doing throughout these talks. Um, just to try to get a flavor of what's going on, I'm going to restrict attention to dimension five, but of course, you know, embedding three and five. 
Um, but of course, um, one, one would be interested in this you know, in, in, in complete generality. I also point out, of course, a three-dimensional case. I usually go back to the three-dimensional case and remind you what happens there before we go on. Well, I'm not doing it here because that's not very interesting. I already told you like on our first, within the first five minutes, I think, of the first talk that any S1 embedded in a contact three manifold can be isotoped and it's easier a small way to be um, a contact embedding. Um, <clears throat> great. Um, so, uh, so um, again, I just re re recall for you that main technical result uh, that I stated in the third talk, I think, um, says that if you can actually braid a, a, a smooth embedding about the standard uh, S3 and S5, then there will be some contact structure on the manifold that actually contact embeds. Um, so, um, and again, that's, this is how it fol follows from the technical result I had before, right? Because once it's braided, you have this branch locus, and as long as you can make that branch locus a contact submanifold or three manifold, you're done, and, and that's easy. Okay, good. Um, so, um, so, so recall also in that third talk, uh, we said that uh, actually all contact structures on S3 can be embedded in the um, isotopy class of the unknot, the standard embedding of S3 and S5. Um, and this actually implies that anytime you have an isotopy class uh, of smooth embedding it, that can be realized by a contact embedding of the standard contact structure on S3, then you actually can further isotop it so that you actually uh, realize any contact structure on S3 um, in that smooth isotopy class. And that's just simply because I mentioned this before, I haven't actually explicitly showed you how to do it, um, but it's very easy to, if you have two embeddings, so you have your embedding, then you have your unknotted embedding, you can easily take ambient connected sums inside of your manifold, and that will actually then change um, any of your contact structures. You start with the standard contact structure, you start connected summing with the overtwisted ones on the unknotted embedding, and you'll get other smooth embeddings that, um, that realize all the contact structures. Okay. Um, so here's one situation where we can say something very explicit. Um, but what about the other smooth embeddings of S3 and S5? Can we actually realize those as contacts embeddings of the standard contact structure? Um, that's, I think, at the moment, it seems like a fairly difficult uh, uh, question, but there might be some, some ideas for that. Um, but what can we show? Um, since we were trying to realize all ice topic class we weren't able to, we said, well, can we actually realize more than one? So, so Rio and I sat down and just do very explicit braided embeddings of S3 into S5. We just showed that you know, there's an infinite family of smooth, different smooth isotopy classes in which you can realize all contact structures as contact embeddings. Um, so we don't know if you can do everything, but you know, we know you can do lots of different things. Um, so um, I point out that these, uh, these embeddings we constructed were using um, th this, this braided technique that I talked about in the third lecture. Um, the, uh, the open book embeddings, or these spun embeddings that we talked about in the second lecture, um, from many perspectives, seem easier than, the, than the, bra the, the branch cover embeddings. So I'd be very curious to maybe have proof theorems like this using these spun embeddings. Now, I actually know you can do it kind of in hindsight. Once you've done this, I can actually create these spun embeddings um, that also realize these isotopy classes. But I'd like to use the, the spun technology to actually construct the embeddings, not kind of go the other way around. You know, build the embedding some other way and then see them a, you know, a posteriori, I guess, from the spun technique. Okay, so I think it's uh, interesting to just kind of build explicit embeddings this way. Um, but again, at the moment, we don't really know how to get all embeddings. So if you can't get all embeddings, what would be the first step in that direction? If you can't get, if you don't know if you can get all embeddings, the next step that you might try um, is regular homotopy classes. So um, <clears throat> um, is there a contact uh, embedding of uh, the standard contact structure on S3 um, in every regular homotopy class of embedding. So let me remind you, what is a regular homotopy class of embedding? A regular homotopy class, uh, if you have actually any immersion, um, an or a homotopy through immersions is called a regular homotopy. So regular homotopy classes of embeddings are you start with an embedding, you have another embedding, you call them regular homotopic if there's an isotopy through immersions. So of course this is much, much weaker than saying they're isotopic, right? Um, in particular, say every knot in S3 is regular homotopic to the unknot. So if you're looking at the regular homotopy class of knots in S3, that's not very exciting, right? Um, but what about knots in um, uh, three-dimensional uh, three S3s embedded uh, knotted in S5? Well, actually, uh, there's a really nice result of uh, Hughes and Melvin from 1985, um, building on work of Hirsch and many others um, who studied quite a bit about um, uh, immersions, uh, that there's actually a z's worth of regular homotopy classes 
of embeddings of S3 and S5. And so it would be really interesting to say, in every one of those, can I actually realize um, a contact embedding of every contact structure on S3? Um, so at the moment, I don't know how to do that, but let me just make a few comments. Um, like I said, there's more questions here than answers. Um, the, uh, the regular homotopy classes, uh, these integers worth of regular homotopy classes in the Hughes-Morton theorem, um, oh, sorry, Melvin, <laughs> Melvin theorem, uh, uh, they're distinguished by the signature of a four manifold, a ciphered surface, a ciphered four manifold for the, uh, the embedding. Um, so if you want to try to actually build or understand all these regular homotopy classes, you'd really like to try to understand if I've given my embedding, how do I construct the, hyper, the, 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 the ciphered hypersurface? Um, so in particular, if you're given your, uh, your embedding through a braiding or through a spun embedding, can you construct an explicit ciphered surface for it or ciphered hypersurface for it? Um, so recall, this is you know, very hopeful because uh, in dimension three, the braiding and the spun embeddings are just braids in S3. And if somebody hands you a closed braid in S3, you can build a very explicit ciphered surface for it, right? So you might try to do a very similar thing in higher dimensions. And I want to point out that uh, Rio, in his thesis, um, has some partial results um, for, for cyclic branch covers. Well, certain cyclic branch covers, he can explicitly construct hyper, ciphered hypersurfaces uh, uh, for uh, braided embeddings. Um, but it'd be nice to generalize that to all braided embeddings. Um, and then try to use that to understand the ciphered hypersurfaces and therefore the regular homotopy classes of embeddings, and then hopefully therefore uh, answer uh, this, uh, this question, you know, hopefully in the positive. Okay. So any questions about, about that? So again, whenever you're trying to answer a problem you can't, maybe try to back up and answer some problem leading in that direction. And I think this is maybe the first thing you might try to do if you can't answer the entire isotopy problem. Okay, so I think that was all I was going to say about the general question. Um, so uh, any, any questions before we move on to uh, trying to isotop contact embeddings uh, from one to the other? Okay, well, good. In that case, let's, let's look at that isotopy problem. So suppose we have two contact embeddings. When can we isotop one of them to the other through contact embeddings? And as I've done throughout the lectures, I'd like to kind of go back into the three-dimensional setting and remind you how this works in the three-dimensional setting and what we understand there, because we understand the situation quite well there, not completely, of course, but quite well, um, and see what sort of techniques we use in the three-dimensional setting in the hopes that maybe we can try to generalize some of those to study the, um, the higher dimensional setting. So while I'm not specifically interested in Legendrian knots, the story there is very nice. It kind of leads to some things uh, elsewhere, so I'd like to just very briefly recall for you uh, what goes on um, for Legendrian embeddings in the standard contact structure on S3. So, uh, so the first invariance that you have for Legendrian knots that people frequently call the classic invariance, because they've been around since classical times, well, okay, not 30, 40, 50 years, but it's not 2000, but anyway. Okay, so, um, so the, the, the classical invariants are the smooth knot type. So of course, if you have two contact embeddings, if they're contact isotopic, then the smooth embeddings are isotopic. So that's an invariant of the knot. You then have the framing induced by the contact structure. So remember Legendrian knot, you have these contact planes wobbling back and forth along it, so they give you a framing. That's an invariant of the isotopy class. And that's, uh, if you have, uh, if you're in S3, so you have a ciphered surface, if you have your contact framing, you can compare it to your ciphered framing and get a number. That number is frequently called the thurston bennekin invariant. Um, uh, <clears throat> and then finally, if you orient L, you don't have to do this, but let's orient L. Remember I said if you can put, if you can orient, you can put the word oriented in front of something, always do it. So we're going to do that here. So uh, if L is an oriented knot, then choose a vector that's directing the knot in the correct orientation. You can uh, define something, a, a rotation number for your Legendrian knot, which is kind of a relative Euler class of the contact structure. So remember, a relative Euler class, if you like, is kind of the obstruction to extending that non-zero vector from L across the entire manifold so that you've got a vector in C that's, that's always non-zero. And if you can do that, then the Euler class is zero. If you can't, then, well, this kind of measures the obstruction to doing that. And um, it lives in the uh, second cohomology relative to L, which in S3 happens to be Z. So it's, uh, we can think of it as a number, Z. Okay? So these are our three classic invariants. So what do our classic invariants tell us about uh, the, uh, the isotopy class of embeddings? Well, as I kind of indicated before, before you do the isotopy classes, maybe try the regular homotopy classes. So what can we say about the regular homotopy classes? Um, well, actually, two Legendrians are regular homotopic. This is, a stand, this is one of Gromov's H principles, that uh, two Legendrians are regular homotopic if and only if their rotation numbers agree. So uh, we have a complete invariant for the regular homotopy classes of, of embeddings. 
Um, OK, great. So that's a good first start. Now let's move into um, the isotopy classes. And of course, you might ask if these three classic invariants determine the Legendre or not. This was a major question back in the, um, in the early 90s. But um, uh, starting in the mid-90s, um, Chikhanov and Eliashberg um, independently um, came up with this differential graded algebra, which is frequently now called the Legendrean contact homology um, uh, differential graded algebra. And um, it's this complicated non-commutative algebra you can use uh, to distinguish, for instance, these two Legendrean knots. These give you two Legendrean knots, and they are distinct. Um, <clears throat> uh, so there's a lot of very interesting things to say here. We might even hear a little bit about it later on today, but um, I'm not going to say um, any more about it. Um, well, I'll say very little more about it as we go on uh, for this lecture. Um, OK, good. So what other non-classical invariants do we have? Well, in uh, 2008, by the way, notice I have 2002 here. That's just when the paper appeared. Actually, Eliasberg's, these are independent. And Eliasberg's paper never appeared on this. He has a, a sketch of an argument in some kind of proceedings or something. But Chikhanov's paper appeared in uh, 2002. But it was the first was, was, was first released in maybe 95, 96, something like this, fairly much earlier than that. Um, anyway, so quite a bit past this work. Um, in 2008, um, Ajvaf, uh, Zabo, and Thurston um, showed how to use uh, not, uh, not fluor homology through these grid diagrams that we heard about yesterday to um, actually distinguish trans, uh, sorry, Legendrian knots. Um, and I should mention also Liska, Ajvaf, uh, Stipchid, Zabo have a different way of kind of coming up with the same invariant, I mean, more generality, actually. Uh, the uh, third technique that you can try to use to, non-classic technique you can try to use to um, to distinguish uh, uh, embeddings of Legendrian knots is actually a, a technique where you actually use convex surfaces. These are a certain special type of surface in a contact manifold where you just try to classify everything. So instead of trying to say, is this one isotopic to this one, I'm going to say, I'm going to understand every possible embedding you can possibly have. Um, and from that, actually, if you get lucky, then you'll actually maybe see things that are not distinguished by their classic invariants. Um, so there's many examples of that. I gave those to you in the first lecture, so let me not spend more time on that. The last thing I want to mention is if you have a Legendrian knot, so this is the set of all Legendrian knots. This is the set of all transverse knots. If you're given a Legendrian knot, there's a natural way to get a transverse knot. And then it turns out any invariant of a transverse knot will be an invariant of a Legendrian knot. And we'll say more about that in a minute. But that gives you another whole host of invariants you can use. Well, OK, maybe not host, one or two. OK, host, that's one or two. Anyway, all right. Um, good. So that's, that's the Legendrian setting. So let's move on to the transverse setting. What can you say there? Um, so uh, what are the classical invariants of a transverse knot? Well, unlike for Legendre knots where you have three classical invariants, you've only got two here. One is the, uh, the, the smooth knot type, again, of course. Um, and the second one is, this, uh, um, is, again, kind of a relative invariant. And if you remember, I defined for you a self-linking number last time by saying, given a ciphered surface for your, um, for your knot, um, trivialize the contact planes, take a non-zero vector field, push the knot off, and measure the self-linking. I'd rather give you a different definition of that, because it's a definition I'd rather use in higher dimensions. Um, and again, it's a relative self-linking number, so it's kind of analogous to this rotation number we had for the, for the, um, for the uh, Legendrian knots. So, um, so take um, a non-zero vector field um, along your transverse knot, and what do I take? I have to have a natural one to take. Well, I have my ciphered surface, so use the ciphered surface it gives you a framing. That framing, I can now take a, a, a vector field that kind of describes that framing along the knot. And now I look at the relative Euler class relative to that framing. And the number you get actually is the self-linking number I gave you before. Ah, another typo. What's the error? There should be a minus sign right there. It's really annoying. I don't know why it happened. But for, for historical reasons, the actual self-linking number is not this relative Euler class. It's actually minus the relative Euler class. Not really sure why, but it is. Um, OK. Um, well, anyway, based on this analogy with Legendre knots, right, this, this relative Euler class looks exactly like our definition for the rotation number, right? <clears throat> um, so you might really expect that there's some sort of H principle that says the self linking number um, is a complete invariant of the regular homotopy class of transverse knots. Um, I actually thought this for a long time. I talked to many people, and they thought this for a long time. It's not true. Um, it's not a regular homotopy class invariant. In fact, every transverse knot can be braided, right? We said that in the first lecture. It's a very easy thing to prove. And if you switch crossings in a braid, that's, that's a, a, a homotopy, a, a regular homotopy through transverse knots, right? So I can change crossings at will, which means I can unknot the knot. So basically, every transverse knot is transversely isotopic to any other transverse knot, essentially. 
Um, and actually, this is not too surprising, right? If you think about it, right? Because the self-linking number, if you know how to relate uh, Legendre knots to transverse knots, like I mentioned earlier, the self-linking number is computed as the thurston bindekin minus the rotation number. So the self-linking kind of inclu include, includes both those pieces of information from the, from the Legendre knot. So, um, so, so, it's, so it's not surprising, since the, the thurston bindekin actually isn't a regular homotopy invariant of the, of the Legendre, that maybe the self-linking for the, the transverse knot shouldn't either. Um, but anyway, that's, there, there, that's good news and bad news, right? So there's no information in the regular homotopy class. We, we, at least we've classified them up to regular homotopy, but it also isn't very interesting. But it also indicates that, you know, that's not going to give you any clues as to studying transverse knots. So there, it gives you a clue why transverse knots might be a little harder to understand than Legendrian knots. I mean, in fact, it was many, many years past um, the work of Chikanov and Eliashberg that distinguished Legendrian knots with, not, with the same class invariants before we could do the same thing for transverse knots. So, um, but before I go on and tell you how to do that, let me just think a little bit about what does the self-linking, if the self-linking doesn't tell you about the regular homotopy class, what does it tell you about? And again, this is going to be important when we move into higher dimensions as well. So suppose you have two transverse knots. Look at their complements. I have two contact structures on the complement of the transverse knots. And in fact, the contact structures are standard near the transverse knots. So I kind of have, I have these two contact structures in the complement of the transverse knots. And um, if they were transversely isotopic, those contact structures would be contactomorphic. So you have the contactomorphism type of the contact structure on the complement. And in particular, you have the plane field described, the homotopy class of the plane field described by the contact structure. And that homotopy class of plane field is what people typically call in dimension three an almost contact structure. Well, people rarely say that, but that's what they should say. Um, uh, and it turns out that basically the self-linking number completely determines the almost contact structure on the complement of the knots. So basically, it's, it's telling you it tell, it's telling you all the bundle theoretic information about the contact structure in the complement. Um, and again, this is a folklore theorem. I think pretty much everybody that studied these things probably knew this result for time immemorial. But um, uh, the, uh, it's been written down by a couple people. I think maybe Geiges has a, a proof written down. I wrote it down in a paper one time. Um, once you know it's true, it's kind of a fun thing to, to work out. Um, I would caution, though, um, the, uh, for, for, for the experts in the audience, um, the, the homotopy class of plane field is determined by two pieces of information in the, in, in the absence of torsion. It's determined by the, uh, the churn class, the Euler class, or in this case, the relative Euler class, and what's called the three-dimensional invariant, this D3 invariant I talked about in other, class, in, in other talks. So you might ask, why is it only this rotation information, this, 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 uh, sorry, this, this, this relative Euler class information we're looking at? What happened to the D3 invariant? Well, it turns out the D3 invariant of the contact structures on the complement are essentially determined by the information coming from S3, not the knot itself. So that's why that kind of that D3 part kind of drops out of this. Um, it's not actually obvious when you think about it from the beginning, but if you, if you work through it, it turns out it's not, you don't need that. It's, it's, it's automatic. We'll actually see a, a shade of that happening later. Okay, good. So that's, uh, that's what the self-linking tells us. So let's, let's think about the isotopy problem again. Um, uh, well, so you go back to the Legendrian setting where he had uh, invariants. So you think about this Legendrian contact homology of Eliashberg and Shikhanov. Does that work? People have spent years and years and years and years trying to get Legendrian contact homology to tell you anything about transverse knots. And it, so far, it doesn't really seem to tell you much. It certainly doesn't distinguish transverse knots. Um, people have come up with all sorts of great tricks and then prove that all those great tricks don't work. So what can you do? Well, it turns out this Hagar floor stuff it actually gives you transverse invariants, and you can distinguish transverse knots that way. Also, this convex surface approach, um, this also works. Um, there's a couple other approaches that work for transverse knots as well. So back in 2006, I've already mentioned this, uh, Bierman and Manasco used braid theory to distinguish transverse knots. They came up with this kind of Markov theorem about stabilization. Um, and the way they studied the transverse knots is by analyzing induced foliations or singular foliations on the ciphered surfaces for the, for the knot. And they were able to distinguish transverse knots using braid theory. Um, um, and then finally, um, D here, the last one I want to talk about for transverse knots, well, actually the second to last one, um, is a filtration on knot contact homology. And I actually debated on spending basically most of my talk talking about this because it's a really fun subject. I quite like it, but um, I wanted to talk about the higher dimensional situation more. So I think I'm just going to restrict myself to a page or so to remind you what this is um, and, and kind of a little bit about how it works. Um, so, so what is not contact homology? Well, the idea is, suppose you take uh, the unit cotangent bundle of, uh, of S3. So the, the cotangent bundle of S3, uh, sorry, of R3 
is, of course, just R6. And the unit cotangent bundle is just, well, it's R3 cross S2, right? unit sphere in every fiber. Well, it turns out this thing has a natural contact structure, which I won't go into, but it's, it's very easy to write down a contact structure there. And now the unit co-normal bundle of an embedding, so if you have a not K in R3, you look at all of the cotangent, the co-vectors, that vanish on the tangents to the not. And if you think about this for half a second, you'll easily convince yourself that's going to give you an S1 bundle over the not. So it's going to give you S1 cross S1. And so it's going to give you a Legendre, and you can also show it's a Legendrian torus inside of our contact uh, unit cotangent bundle. Um, and you can use the Legendrian contact homology that I, we talked about earlier that was originally introduced by Jakanov and Eliashberg and has been generalized in higher dimensions by many people um, to come up with an invariant of this Legendrian torus that actually is an invariant of the underlying not K. So uh, the, the details of this uh, were written down um, by, by uh, um, Ekholm, uh, Tobias Ekholm, uh, Mike Sullivan, and Lenny Ng and myself. Um, Lenny Ng has actually explored this extensively, and Linny has shown that this is an amazing invariant. It, it distinguishes tons and tons of different things, and it was conjecture for a long time that maybe it's a complete invariant, and actually breaking news last week, so I didn't put a date here, but the date is actually last week, um, Vivek Shindis put out a paper uh, that, that, that basically says that this, this not contact homology is a complete invariant, um, which is nice, but we have lots of complete invariants of knots. What's really cool about it is it actually says that the contact geometry in the unit cotangent bundle completely recaptures the underlying smooth topology of the embeddings. Yeah? What? I thought he claimed that in the paper too, no? Well, let me put it this way. The most interesting thing to me is the fact that actually this, this unit uh, co-normal is a complete, it completely recovers the topology of K. I think that's the most interesting thing. He definitely claims that. I thought he claimed the other, but um, I didn't understand a lot of what I was reading anyway, so I'm not 100% sure that he maybe did, but um, you're backing me up here, maybe. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah, I think he was, he, was, he, was, he was, I think he was referencing some, un, so, so some work to come and mentioning this, but yeah, may, maybe it wasn't actually in that paper. I think that might be right. Okay, good. Um, uh, great. So um, basically, uh, the way this was computed in dimension three was you actually took your knot, you braided it, and you used the, bra you used the braiding um, understanding of your embedding to actually compute uh, these invariants for the knot. So I think a very interesting question is, can you use these braided embeddings in higher dimensions to similarly try to explicitly compute uh, this, this, uh, this, this knot contact homology in, in, in the higher dimensional setting as well? Um, it's definitely going to be quite a bit more complicated, but it's, I think, I think possible. Okay, great. So that's not contact homology. This has nothing to do with transverse knots. This is not contact homology. But remember I said there's a filtration on not contact homology, and that comes from the following. Um, basically, uh, this not contact homology is computed by, uh, by, by counting, um, by counting uh, uh, holomorphic curves in the symplectization of the contact manifold. So it's going to be R cross your unit cotangent bundle. So this is a six manifold, and you're, you're, you're counting holomorphic curves in there. Well, if you have a contact structure, say the standard one on R3, it turns out that that lifts up to a, um, a, a complex two-manifold, so a four-dimensional manifold in this symplectized unit cotangent bundle. Well, a four-manifold in a six-manifold is generically going to intersect a two-manifold, a disk, a holomorphic disk, in points. And so you can use those intersections to filter the, uh, the, the differential you get in the, in the knot contact homology, and that filtered complex you get um, by using the contact structure, turns out to be a really good invariant of transverse knots. Um, and uh, again, how good it is, we don't know. We don't know it's a complete invariant or anything, but we do know that, um, that it distinguishes an awful lot of things. There's very few of the, say, small crossing knots that it doesn't uh, distinguish. And actually, they might distinguish those too. We just don't know it distinguishes those. Um, and so the last invariant I'll mention is, uh, so Olga, um, 2006, um, uh, used uh, Kavanov homology to define an invariant of transverse knots. Um, at the moment, we don't know if it actually distinguishes transverse knots, but it seems to have lots of interesting properties. Um, uh, and as far as I know, this is at least at the high level all the invariants I know to try to distinguish transverse knots in dimension three. Um, there are some refinements, say, uh, uh, of this work into other uh, versions of homology and so on. Um, so I, but I don't want to go into every last detail. But, um, but that's where we sit in dimension three. So any questions about the three-dimensional setting? Okay, well, let's move up a dimension, uh, two dimensions. 
Um, so what about the five-dimensional case? Um, <clears throat> so um, what are the classic invariants in dimension five? Well, as always, you've got the smooth isotopy class of the embedding, of course, right? So you've always got that. Um, well, in, in the higher dimensional setting, unlike the three-dimensional setting, right? In the three-dimensional setting, you just had a knot, an S1. What's the contact structures on S1? Well, there's one, right? So that's not a very interesting invariant of the transverse knot, of the contact embedding. But in high dimensions, when you have a contact embedding, there's an induced contact structure, or there's an induced contact structure on, on the uh, submanifold. And if those two uh, sub contact structures are different, there's no way you're gonna have an isotopy through contact structures, through, through contact embeddings that takes one to the other, because that would give you an isotopy between the, the contact structures, which would say they had to be the same. So for instance, um, uh, the, the examples I, I told you about earlier, um, uh, with, with Rio, um, uh, give lots of examples of different contact structures uh, on uh, the unknot embedded in S5, and those can't be contact isotopic. So that's actually an effective invariant. We can use it to distinguish things, right? Okay, well, what else? Well, just like in dimension three, remember to distinguish transverse knots, we saw the self linking number was essentially the thing that determined the contact, the almost contact structure in the complement of the knot. So you can ask the same thing. You can look at the almost contact structure in the complement of the embedding. So what does that get us? Let's see. Um, so what is the almost contact structure in dimension five? So what is an almost contact structure? The right definition, at least in dimension five, is as follows. Well, one of the definitions you can give. Um, it's just a hyperplane field, so a four-dimensional um, plane field inside of our tangent bundle that has an uh, almost complex structure on it. An almost complex structure is simply a linear bundle map whose square is minus the identity. Um, and this is, the, this, is, this is information that if you have a contact structure, you get this, right? Because your contact hyperplane is a hyperplane field. And uh, the one form, the contact one form, gives you this conformal symplectic structure. And to those, there's, there's a naturally associated up to homotopy, um, almost complex structure. So contact structures give you these. Um, and um, and uh, uh, an interesting fact is that this almost contact structure is completely determined by its first churn class. And remember, the first churn class is an H upper two. Well, say it's completely determined if there's no two torsion. Um, let me not worry about the two torsion situation. Yeah? Uh, there is, there is. And, and in general, these will not be integrable. I mean, finding integral complex structures, I mean, you have to figure out what you mean by integral, but you can, you can come up with a notion of integral, like then you have a nice CR structure and people study those. That actually gives you extra structure um, to your... Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. Well, an integral CR structure. I mean, I guess you can talk about non-integral ones too, but yeah. Um, but yeah, that's definitely much more rigid structure if you demand it to be integrable. And, but yeah, we're not, we're not. Okay, good. So, um, so why is C1, um, why does C1 determine uh, this thing? Well, um, it's because basically almost contact structure, if you think about this, having this almost complex structure on a co-dimension one plane field, it actually reduces the structure group of the tangent bundle from SO5, which is what you typically have for an oriented five manifold, to U2, basically a complex two-dimensional bundle because perpendicular to this is just kind of a trivial R bundle, so you kind of forget about that direction. So, um, so that's what an almost contact structure really is. And of course, then almost contact structures, if you know the bundle theory here, how you understand when you can reduce structure groups, that corresponds to understanding sections of an associated SO5 mod U2 bundle. Well, SO5 mod U2 happens to be diffeomorphic to CP2. That's not obvious. In fact, it's very hard. It took me a week or two to convince myself, even when I had a proof in front of me that it was true, but, um, but it is true. Um, and CP3 um, is actually, we understand the homotopy groups there, which tells us the bundle theory of, of these sections. And basically, the, in dimension, if you look at the homotopy groups up through dimension five, the only one that's non-zero, the only relevant one that's non-zero is uh, in, in dimension two. So it basically says it's, uh, the, the, these homotopy classes of uh, almost contact structures are completely determined by what's going on on the two skeleton. And it's not very hard then to work out that that obstruction to making things the same is actually just the first turn class of the complex structure um, associated to, to the almost contact structure. Okay, so that's maybe more detailed than we needed, but if you wanna kinda know why that's true, it's because of that. But when you see a statement like this, um, it's kind of confusing to me, right? Because I've got a complex two-dimensional bundle. If you have a complex two-dimensional bundle, what do you have? You've got a first turn class and a second turn class. Another thing that's really confusing to me when I first started studying this, and by first started studying this, I mean up until maybe a few months ago, um, if you look at homotopy classes of plane fields, so forget the complex structure, just the homotopy class of plane fields, they're actually determined by something that goes on on the four skeleton, not the two skeleton. 
what's going on here? That just seems very bizarre, right? We've got, we've got a more rigid structure, but it has nothing to do with the thing that determines the less rigid structure. Anyway, very, very confusing. But let's try to explain that. Um, so since you have a complex two-dimensional bundle, you have a C1 and C2. So what happened to the C2? Well, if you look at the Pontryagin classes, the Pontryagin classes for a bundle satisfy the following. So the Pontryagin class of my almost contact hyperplane is, well, if you add on a trivial bundle, you have this kind of you know, standard product formula from characteristic classes. By the way, this is all modular torsion. I don't want to think about torsion here. Actually, this is in H upper four, so I guess there is no torsion for this one, but this one actually is an issue. Anyway, um, so, so these are equal. And of course, this is just the tangent bundle to your manifold. And the Pontryagin class to the tangent bundle to the manifold, that's a topological invariant, right? That has nothing to do with your almost contact structure. Well, you also have this nice formula that if you have a complex uh, bundle, then the first Pontryagin class is related to the turn classes as follows. By the way, this formula hopefully is familiar. This is how you prove this nice, you know, uh, C1 squared equals uh, three signature plus two Euler characteristic in dimension four. This is exactly the formula you use. Um, but anyway, so you just kind of solve for this, and you see that C1, this, this information about your homotopy class of almost contact structure, is completely determined by topological information plus C1. Um, so C1 is really the only real piece of information here, right? Again, for the experts, there's also a five-dimensional obstruction to homotoping hyperplane fields in dimension five, and I still don't understand where the hell that went in here, but if anybody knows, I'd love to hear it. But anyway, let me not belabor that. Okay, good. So, so we have C1 and C2, but C2 is kind of derivative information, right? It kind of comes from stuff we already know if you know C1. Uh, okay, so what can we do now? Um, so now suppose that we're given an embedding. Um, oh, by the way, this discussion was all for a closed three-manifold, a uh, closed five-manifold. Now we want to do the relative setting. So suppose we have an embedding of a three manifold, contact three manifold into a contact five manifold. Um, we want to understand the almost contact structure on the complement. So of course that's determined by a relative C1, just like uh, in the closed case it was determined by C1 itself. Um, but what does a relative C1 really mean? So to define that, let me uh, make a few observations or make a few assumptions here. So let's assume that my contact three manifold had a trivial uh, turn class. That means that actually there's a non-zero section of C. So let's take that non-zero section V. Let's also assume that M has a trivial normal bundle in W, which basically also means that C has a trivial normal bundle in C prime. So we can write C prime as C direct sum C as bundles. Right? Um, so let's take U to be a non-zero section of this, this normal bundle part. So we have these two non-zero sections of uh, my contact hyperplane C prime. And we have J as an almost complex structure on C prime. Right? We have the associated almost complex structure. Well, finally, if you have two non-zero sections along something in, in a complex bundle, you can define the following. The, the relative first turn class is simply the obstruction to extending this frame, this complex frame, on the, the, the submanifold across all of uh, C prime. And you can easily work out that that actually is an element in H upper 2 of uh, the W rel M. Okay? Similarly, you have this uh, C2, which is actually obstruction to extending the normal vector field. So you you, we took this non-zero section of the normal bundle. So C2 is simply the relative obstruction to extending that to a non-zero vector field on all of C prime. And it exists in H upper 4, M rel, uh, W rel M. Um, but this is a little bit you know, annoying, because notice you can only define um, C2 if you have a trivial normal bundle. And you can only define C1 if you have a trivial normal bundle and the induced contact structure on the submanifold is has trivial turn class, first turn class. So again, it's a little bit annoying that you have these restrictions on the way you can define these things. It'd be nice to come up with some way to define them in more generality, but I don't, I don't know how to do that at the moment at least. Um, good. Well, um, if you can define them both, then once again, C2 is more or less determined by C1, just like in the closed case, more or less the same formulas hold. Um, so let's consider the situation that we've been, been really most interested in of our three-manifold, contact three-manifold embedded in the standard or any contact structure on S5. Well, in that case, we know that C1 of the, of the contact structure on the three-manifold is zero, right? We proved that in the second uh, lecture. Um, we also know the normal bundle is trivial. That's just smooth topology. So we really can define C1 and C2. But now uh, you, you have a little bit of a disappointing thing here because you're trying to you know, use these as ways of distinguishing different transverse, different contact embeddings. But if you say, for instance, look at, say, knotted S3s and S5, the homology of the complement of an S3 and S5, well, that's just a homology S1 cross D4, which means there is no relative homology in, in H upper 2. So there is no 
first churn class. And if the first churn class determines the second churn class, there's no second churn class. So this is a little bit depressing. Um, the homotopy class um, of contact structure is just determined by kind of the embedding of the contact structure, not by any uh, churn class information. And in fact, you can make that very explicit in certain cases. If you have an embedding, two embeddings of a contact structure on S3 into the over-twisted structure on S5, such that their complements are over-twisted, um, and, and, and the induced contact structure uh, on the three sphere is the same, then actually there's a diffeomorphism that throws one of the embeddings onto the other. So I can't say they're isotopic, but I can say that they're related by a, by a, by a, a contactomorphism. Um, so it is really telling you that there is no interesting information about the almost contact structure in the complement of an embedding um, of an S3 and S5. And you can make it very explicit for an overtwisted contact structure. So, so loose, meaning complements overtwisted, knots in the overtwisted S5 are essentially completely determined by the, the topological embedding and the induced contact structure. So no churn class information, no kind of generalizations of this self-linking from dimension three. Okay, <clears throat> well, let's... Even though this is true, let's explore it a little bit you know, further, even though it seems like there's no information here. Let's explore it a little bit further. Um, so um, so we're, we're going back to this more general embedding, not just in S3. Um, if M happens to be null homologous, you can define kind of a generalization of the self-linking number simply to be the second churn class evaluated on a ciphered hypersurface for your, for your submanifold. Um, so this is... By the way, let's remember, right? C1 determines the almost contact structure. C2 is derivative information. So C2 is less information than C1, right? Moreover, we're not even getting all of C2 here. We're just getting C2 evaluated on a particular homology class, relative homology class. So this self-linking is, uh, in general, quite a bit less information than you might hope for. Um, but one nice thing about it is it's really easy to compute. Um, there, there are actually formulas for computing this that involve the ciphered hypersurface, just like you have in dimension like you have in dimension um, three. Um, uh, so even though you're kind of giving up a lot of useful information, um, this might be a good thing to try to work with. Um, so as I said, um, um, uh, you, you can try to compute it using um, a ciphered hypersurface. Um, this invariant has been known to experts, I think, forever. Everybody I've talked to more or less knew about it. Um, but it was explicitly written down in some papers by Atsuhiko Mori and Ryo Furukawa. Um, and Rio, in his thesis, actually um, had this really nice observation. Remember I said um, a contact embedding of an S3 and S5 is completely determined by the induced contact structure, right? And the embedding. Well, he actually showed that if you're in the, standard, if you're in the trivial embedding, if you're in the, the unknotted embedding, um, then the self-linking is just um, twice the D3 invariant of the contact structure here. So it really doesn't have anything to do with the complement. It's just determined by the actual induced contact structure. Um, Unfortunately, he only proved it for the standard embedding, so it'd be really interesting to know, um, is there some more complicated, formula, more complicated formula, or maybe the same one, I don't know, um, for, for general embeddings, general contact embeddings, and, and that I have no idea. Uh, but in theory, the, the homotopy class can depend on the actual smooth embedding as well, so. Um, okay. Um, a couple other results about the self-linking number. Um, so Rio did actually prove that if you're not in dimension five, but if you're in any dimension that's congruent to uh, three mod four for the ambient space, then there actually are embeddings that are distinguished by the relative self-linking number, or this, sorry, the self-linking number, but aren't distinguished by the induced contact structure on the embedding. So these can, this can be useful information, but, um, but only, at least at the moment, only in those dimensions. So it's not true, at least at the moment, we don't know if it's true in dimensions congruent to one mod four. Maybe it is, maybe it's not. Um, and finally, you might ask, once you have a self-linking number, you might ask, is, oh. Uh, it, it, actually, what he does is he takes the standard embedding and he does some, he does a, a braided embedding um, of the standard embedding, and then he uses the, and it's a cyclic, it's a cyclic braided embedding, and uh, because it's cyclic, it's a fairly simple structure, so you can actually build a ciphered surface for it, and then he analyzes the, kind of the, the characteristic information on that ciphered hyper surface to actually compute the self-linking number. Oh, because he's, he's uh, well, he's, 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 he's taking various branch covers, and he's, in the branch covering construction, you just kind of can see some overtwisted, something overtwisted. I, I must admit, I actually haven't read the, all the details of this proof, but I mean, that's, that's the outline. So I mean, somehow through the branch covering construction, he must just see that he's building something overtwisted as he does that. But yeah, I, I'm not 100% sure. Um, okay, once you have a self-linking number, you might think, 
you know, we have these tight and overtwisted in higher dimensions now. Are those related to some sort of Binnikin inequality like you have in dimension three? Um, well, um, Mori, um, in a 2009 paper, um, actually proved that there are embeddings um, basically in any dimension, um, uh, in, any, um, in any odd dimension um, above, uh, above five or above uh, that don't satisfy the Binnikin inequality. So they don't satisfy the Binnikin inequality. Um, oh, by the way, you can also get things that are less. So you might hope, well, maybe what about the other one? <laughs> but it's easy to construct things where the self-linking is less than that. And it's hard to do this, but he did it. Um, so uh, at the moment, there doesn't seem like there's any way you can use self-linking to kind of understand this sort of information. Um, by the way, I would like to kind of you know, just pause for a second and think, uh, think about this. In dimension three, you can recognize overtwistedness by setting transverse things or Legendrian things. So you might think, well, maybe in high dimensions, I should use Legendrian, not not, trans, not these, these contact embeddings. I actually claim you've got a much better chance of making it work for contact embeddings than Legendrian things because of the existence of loose Legendrian knots. So it basically says for every kind of algebraic data associated with Legendrian knot, you can realize a loose one in a contact manifold. So you're not going to get kind of algebraic information like a self-linking number that's going to tell you anything interesting using Legendrians. So your best hope is that something is going to work with these co-dimension two contact embeddings. Um, but even there, at least this, this really simple thing, the self-linking, isn't going to help you. At least not in an obvious way. So of course the obvious questions are, is there some other version of some Binnikin inequality that might work? Can you use your other churn classes to come up with some sort of inequalities or conditions um, that are uh, required to hold when you're in a tight structure or say the standard one versus an overtwisted one? Um, and if you could do this, can you actually compute the churn classes in any explicit way? Um, at the moment, we don't know how to do that except for the self-linking in some situations. Um, uh, and uh, the, the most interesting question is, are there non-classical invariants? So we've been spending our time talking about the classic invariants. What about non-classical invariants? Something like the Higgard floor homology or whatever in dimension three. Well, um, let's go through the things in dimension three. Higgard floor homology, well, it doesn't exist in high dimensions. Now, there are some, there are some attempts uh, by Kalan and Honda to uh, define some version of a Hagar floor homology in higher dimensions, but if that's going to have any hope of answering the sort of questions we're interested in here, uh, at the moment it doesn't look like it. It's going gonna, it's gonna to require years of development if it's going to work at all, but um, at the moment I'll say there's no theory of this in, in higher dimensions that might work. Um, what about convex surface approach? Well, there are convex hypersurfaces in, in, in higher dimensions. In theory, you might try to do the same sort of thing we did in dimension five, uh, three. Um, but in practice, I think you've got almost no hope of that because all of your favorite properties and all the favorite things you're going to use in dimension three don't seem to hold in higher dimensions. Um, so what about the braid theory approach? Well, we have braids now in high dimensions. Why don't you use a braid theory approach like Vierman and Manasco did? Well, the braid theory approach, remember I told you you take your ciphered hybrid surface and you look at kind of the induced distribution on it. That, in some sense, is a much harder version of convex surface theory. So if your convex surface theory isn't going to work, it's really unlikely you're going to be able to make this work as well. So you can try, and maybe, maybe you can get smart and make it work or something. But, uh, um, but uh, um, it seems like it should be harder than the convex surface theory approach. So maybe that's not a great idea. What about filtered contact homology? I was really excited about this. I actually spent a couple weeks thinking hard about it and trying to figure out how you might try to compute it um, until you just something dawns on you and you realize it's a completely stupid idea. So why is it a completely stupid idea? Well, let's think about what the unit conormal construction does. So if you have an S3 embedded in S5, well, the unit conormal bundle is R3 cross S4, so that's a nine manifold, right? And um, the unit conormal bundle to your embedding is an S3 cross S1. Uh, so it's a Legendrian S3 cross S1. Okay, fine. So far, so good. So the contact homology is going to compute holomorphic curves um, in the simplectization of my contact manifold. That's a 10 manifold. So I have a 10 dimensional manifold that I need to compute, that I need to count holomorphic curves in to compute the not contact, the, the not contact homology here. So now we want to filter it to get an invariant of transverse embeddings, of contact embeddings. So what happens? Well, um, the lift of the contact structure on R5 turns out to be a copy of R cross R5 in my simplectization. So that's a six manifold in a 10 manifold. So generically, it's not going to intersect two-dimensional things, right? It's not going to intersect a disk. So basically, my generic holomorphic disk is going to be disjoint from this. It's not going to provide a filtration for me. So you have no hope of this working in dimension five or any higher dimensions. That's actually a great question. Um, but now you need to find some algebraic gadget that's going to remember those for you. But yes, that's, I think, a, a great 
a, um, a great way to go. So actually, um, I was discussing this with Tobias uh, Ekholm when I was uh, um, at the Mithag Leffler Institute last year, and we started thinking about, yeah, so try to take families of holomorphic disks. Um, and certainly, you know, you, you can then, you know, be sure that you will expect to have these intersections. Um, but now again, we just don't know really what the structure is you want to do on it. Now maybe, um, in theory, you might have some sort of higher order structures on the induced, say, contact homology or linearized contact homology, and then some sort of, I don't know, filtration on that. But what this means algebraically and how to do it, I mean, at the moment, we're kind of at a loss. But, um, but it, th that is a hope, as soon as you can find a way to actually, you know, in, in, encompass that in, 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 a, in a meaningful way. But, but yeah. Um, but yeah, so, so right. So how can you fix this? So yeah, the families might be a good way. Um, are there other ways to fix it? Is there some way to kind of augment this and actually get a higher dimensional uh, thing? That might be the easiest thing to do. If you could actually have this built on top of contact homology instead of trying to build something new, um, that would be great. But at the moment, we have no idea. Um, uh, are there other ways to use um, Legendre contact homology or ordinary contact homology to get a similar invariant? So another thing uh, that Tobias and I talked about quite a bit is if you have a contact submanifold of another contact manifold, you can arrange that the ray vector fields of the submanifold um, uh, are part of the ray vector field for the bigger manifold. So you might hope that you could have like a, a, the contact homology of the submanifold, including in the contact manifold of the bigger manifold. But then you start doing index computations and moduli spaces don't work out right. So it's not entirely clear how that's going to work either. So it's really, I mean, all of your first step approaches don't seem to work very well. And you might wonder, well, I mean, is there anything we can do there? And are there other ideas? So I've actually played around with trying to use branch covers and surgery operations and then see if what you get on the resulting manifolds you know, are different to try to distinguish things. Um, I'm actually still hopeful that might work, but at the moment there's nothing really to report. So again, more questions than answers um, uh, at the moment. Um, but I think, yeah, at this point, just I'd like to thank everybody for uh, putting up with me for five lectures. And again, I'd really like to thank the organizers for, for putting this together and inviting me to give these talks, and thanks. <laughs>